Well, good morning, everybody. How about if we uh, get started here today? Uh, before we do, I just uh, was asked to make a quick announcement so that everybody knows on um, Tuesday, which is the second, their uh, Thrivent Financial will be coming in either at 2 o'clock or 6.30, and they're going to be talking to, uh, a whole lot of information about charitable giving. And what they really are going to talk about is estate planning. Um, and you may or may not have thought of this or known this. Uh, my parents never did. My parents never put together a will. And, and there's a, I know there's a whole lot of people in that generation that never did. Uh, and it wasn't on their radar. Uh, and that's all right. Uh, but in today's world, you know what happens if you don't have a will, everything goes to probate if it's not taken care of and you run into a lot of, lot of problems. Um, and and they, they're not necessarily going to talk to you about how to do a will, but they will talk to you about estate planning. And uh, for example, for myself, uh, my wife and I, we wrote a will a number of years ago. And in our will, it says if both of us go, uh, whatever church we're at, we leave 10% of, of whatever we have will go to the church, whatever church we're at. Uh, so if I die while I'm here, you know, you're good. So, uh, But a lot of people don't think along those lines about leaving something for the church. Uh, you know, we just, we die. We hope the church will have our funeral, right? But there also comes, why don't, would you please consider that Whatever that might be, leaving a gift for the church. But that's Tuesday at 2 in the afternoon at 6.30 at night. Okay, Thrive and Financial, they'll come and talk to you through that. How about we start with a word of prayer and we'll jump into this Bible study. Father, today we want to talk about your promises and your blessings, especially along those lines that you'll give us what we ask for. Now, before we just jump on that, Holy Spirit, would you clue us in about our responsibility in that train of thought. Today, Jesus, may you be praised and glorified in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Now, you have that Bible study right in front of you, that guideline, and I got a lot of scriptures that are, are on here uh, that we really want to talk about because I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of come at this two different ways. I want you to know, as it's written there, the Lord has most assuredly promised to answer prayer. Now, however, I, I want to also tell you this, that he is not Santa Claus. He's not, uh, uh, you know, uh, he's not a judge. He's not a whole lot of things that we make him out to be. And I want you to also know, and I've said this before, I'm not a name it, claim it preacher. I, I, I have a real difficult time with name it, claim it. Uh, I have a real difficult time with prosperity theology. Because I've been to some of the very poorest places in the world, and they will give you every last penny they have, and they're still going to be absolutely poor. And it's not because God doesn't love them, all right? When you talk about prosperity theology, can I really clue you in? It's really in places like Europe and Western civilization. You don't hear a whole lot of, of prosperity theology in poor parts of the world. So I want to season that as we read these Scripture verses because here's what you've got to know as we read through these Scripture verses. Either we take the Word of God literally at face value or you don't. So when God says, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you, how do you understand that? How do you interpret that? And that's where some of this problem comes in with our theology. But if you'll listen to this whole Bible study, you'll find that God does give us what we ask for. Okay? So here are 12 passages of Scripture in which the Lord tells us that He wants us to pray to Him and that He wants to answer our prayers and that He'll give us what we ask for. Twelve of them. I probably could have added a few more. So uh, here's what we're going to do. Let's read these all together, okay? Everybody have that Bible study guideline in front of them? Let's read them together. Matthew 7, 7. Read it with me. 
Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Well, what do you think that means? Ask, seek, knock, and there's always an and, right? And this is going to happen. This is going to happen. This will happen. All right? Uh, Matthew 18, 19. Read it with me. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Hmm, how do you interpret that? How do you understand that? If there's two of us who agree on anything touching the face of this earth, what does it say? It shall be done, right? Matthew 21, 22. Please read it with me. In all these things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Kind of a condition there, right? Believing. You've got to ask and then believe. Mark eleven twenty four. Read it with me. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted to you. Huh. Are you getting kind of a train of thought here? I mean, God's saying this over and over again to us. He's kind of like shouting us. Mark, uh, Luke eleven thirteen. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? John 14, 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Do you believe Him? John 16, 23. In that day you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Let's all let that soak in for a little bit, just a second or so. Romans 10, 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Ephesians 2.18, For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Hebrews 4.16, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 10.19, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Stop there. And last one, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Over and over again, we find all these scriptures that say, you ask, God answers, right? You ask, God responds. If you ask according to his will, God will give. He's a great God. He's a good God. So I have, I have no bone about preaching that, about teaching that. I know it's the absolute truth. And I hope you know that too. These are just a, a few of the passages from God's Word that tells us that there is absolutely no question, there should be no question in our mind that God wants us to pray and that He promises to answer our prayers. However, does this mean that God will answer our every prayer and that He is at our beckon and call to answer our request? Yeah, the answer to that is no. Let me just confirm that in you. <laughs> but sometimes we're not quite like that. Sometimes we don't think that way. Sometimes we think because I said it, God must say yes to it. He must do it my way. Or he's not a very loving God. I think there's a lot of people that have that idea that, and, and they never consider that God has placed a very specific restriction or limits on how he answers us. 
If you preach one without the other, I believe you'll mislead people. And that's where we come up with some of the theology. You know, this a name it, claim it. I, I don't see that. I think that's pushy. Uh, by the way, he's God, I'm not. All right? Whether I like it or not, he's still God. And there's this respect factor that goes along with that. There's an honor that's due his name. Lots of people wonder why their prayers aren't answered, and they think God doesn't hear them. Some even wonder if God is real, if he's truthful, if he's honorable. I prayed, nothing happened. Why should I pray again? The problem with unanswered prayer doesn't lie with God, but it lies with us. So what I want to do for the rest of our time here is look at what God has to say about this. I wrote this out there. God instructs us there are conditions on Him answering our prayers. I know we don't like necessarily like thinking of God along the lines of conditions, but God has conditions. I mean, Ten, ten Commandments are conditions, aren't they? They're commandments, but they're conditions. He lays it down and says, Thou shalt not. Not think about it or ponder it. Try it once. Experiment. He says, thou shalt not. Those are conditions. He told the people of Israel, if you obey my commands, I'll do this, 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 this. However, if you don't, this is what's going to happen. And you all know what they chose to do. God's promise isn't a blanket promise to give us our every whim and wish because he won't honor or reward unfaithfulness. There are prohibitions or conditions on having our prayers answered. Here's the first one. First, a person must be a child of God. Now, you heard me say it, didn't you? Yeah, God only hears one prayer from a lost man, and that is the prayer of faith when an unsaved person asks for forgiveness and receives Christ as their Savior. That's the only prayer he hears from someone who has not committed their life to him. I've said this before. Uh, my kids may not be the smartest. My kids may not be the wealthiest, best dressed, my, or best looking. But you know who eats at my table? My kids. Okay? Now, if my kids bring friends home, they eat at my table too. But they still eat the food that I offer them. So an unsaved person who doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, who have never committed their life to Christ, they can pray all, that, pray all they want. God does not hear any of their prayers. God doesn't answer the prayers of those that reject Him as Savior and Lord. Read with me John 9, 13. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does His will, He hears them. Well, we cannot come to God without belief or faith in God. During Jesus' ministry, they brought to Him a child that had an evil spirit, and Jesus asked the boy's father, If you can, if you can all things are possible to him who believes. Remember, the man asked him, If you can, can you? Can you heal my son? If you can, if you can, anything is possible to the one who believes. In Hebrews 11, which is called the great Bible's Hall of Faith, the Lord says this. Would you read verse 6 with me? And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. See, I know that I, even as I say this and I bring this all out and you read it for yourself in black and white, it doesn't always sit really nice within us when we start talking about God having conditions. But what kind of God would it be that just said yes to everything that you ever asked for? You'd be more spoiled than you are now. <laughs> so would I. I mean, I remember my mother calling me a spoiled brat. I didn't like it then. I don't like it now. Why? 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 Because why? I'm selfish. 
I want it, I want it now, I want it my way. I don't like conditions. I mean, how many of you have ever gotten a speeding ticket? Go ahead, raise your hand. Why? You know the limit, right? It says speed limit. It does not say speed suggestion. It says this is the limit. 55. It kind of settles it, doesn't it? Okay, so I remember one day I, was, uh, I had to go to Rosemont High School to pick my son up from basketball practice. He did not have his driver's license. I got, uh, uh, I think I told this story a long time ago. I picked him up. I picked up two of his friends. I, I was taking him back home. I'm going down this road and a police officer was coming. The police officer, uh, she, uh, all of a sudden she whipped around. And uh, she was right on my tail, and I thought, I wonder what she's doing. Speed limit's 45. I'm doing 45. I do speed limit most of the time. <laughs> and, and so I pull over like a good citizen, thinking she's got some place to go, and she stops right behind me. She gets out of her car, and she says, Sir, do you realize how fast you were going? No, 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 no. She asked me, do you know how fast you were going? I said, yes, I was doing 45. She says, do you know what the speed limit is? I said, yes, it's 45. She goes, no, it's not. And I said, yes, it is. <laughs> in, my, in my world, it's 45. No, <laughs> no listen, I, I, I drove that road for years. I knew it was 45. She says, no, it's not. It's 30. I said, 30? I said, when did they change it? She said, last week. Oh I said, well, it was 45. She goes, I know, but now it's 30. She went to her car. She punched in her numbers, and she came back and gave me a $75 speeding ticket. I said, you got to be kidding me. I've never had a speeding ticket in my life. She goes, well, you do now. <laughs> So I had a conversation with my brother, who is, who was, he was at the time, a uh, county cop for Mille Lacs County. And I often said, you do not want to go through Mille Lacs County and it was speeding because he would write my own mother up. So he'll definitely write you up. So I talked to him about it and he asked me the question. He says, well, because I was mad. I was like, where's the grace? I mean, they just changed the speed limit last week. And he said, but were you speeding? I said, that's not the point. He said, yes, it is the point. <laughs> he said, were you speeding? And I said, well, in her world, yes. <laughs> not in mine. <laughs> the truth of the matter was that I was speeding. Okay? There is a speed limit. Why would we ever get mad at the police officer for writing us a ticket for breaking the speed limit? Okay? Why would we think that God would just keep answering our prayers when we're constantly breaking the limit? Okay? Even though his word says, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. You can't keep breaking the speed limit and just think that you're going to keep receiving. And so we must come to the Lord with unwavering faith in him would you read with me James 1, 5 through 7? But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind, for that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. You can't be shifting back and forth. And I know we can sit here and say, well, you know what? Especially when tragedy comes, when trials come, when hardships come, we kind of go back and forth, don't we? Oh, I wonder if God, how come God's not answering? But it's kind of like that puppy thing. Here, here puppy, here puppy, here puppy. Okay, we want God, we snap our finger, and we want God to do it now. God, where are you? God, how come? God, why? When? God. <whistles> Come here, buddy. Right? 
God's not like that. Okay? And so we've got to come in Him with faith that says, I know you're God, and I know you know what's best. I may not like it. I may not understand it, but I know you know what's best. And I know this. I'm in the palm of your hand, <coughs> and nobody can snatch me from the palm of your hand. I'm safe. I'm secure. I'm standing on solid rock. All other ground is? Okay. Now, here's something else that I really want you to think about. Because, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't try to critique people's prayers. But um, sometimes when we pray, we're like really downers. I mean, we're just like, we, we, we're just like, like grumblers, mumblers. And we kind of come to God and we're kind of like, whoa, you know, like Eeyore from, uh, yeah, from uh, what's his name? Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. Oh, my. Oh, God. And we kind of, we just kind of drone. I don't know. I, I mean, I've been in the deepest, darkest pits. I don't drone. I mean, I got to get, I got to have some spunk. I mean, if the greasy wheel gets the grease, guess what? <laughs> I'm going to squeak. Okay. And sometimes, sometimes we just drone when we pray. And sometimes we just complain when we pray. And sometimes when we pray, we're not even praying right. Who did Jesus say we should pray to? The Father, right? Okay, uh, if, if we broke this down, I mean, we have people who say Jesus is our brother, right? Guess what? When my dad was around, when I was a kid, I didn't go ask my brother for anything. Number one, because first of all, he would have just beat me up. And second, I would have got what I wanted, okay? But if I went, I talked to my dad. So when we pray, we pray to the Father. But what gets the Father's attention? His Son, Jesus. When you start reminding the Father of what Jesus did on the cross, He sits up. He's all ears. He is full attention. When you pray in Jesus' name, he goes, ooh, I like that. Okay? I, 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 I mean, yeah, Jesus is the king. But I pray to the Father, Daddy, in Jesus' name, in his Son, by the power of the blood, by the cross, by the empty tomb. Now you know why Paul says, I want to know the power of the resurrection because there's life in that power. There's life in Jesus' name. And I pray under the unction of the Holy Spirit. And when I pray under the unction of the Holy Spirit, and I'm not talking about speaking in tongues or anything, I'm talking about praying, letting the Holy Spirit actually have his way with me. Guess what? I don't drone. I just don't, uh, it's not, that's not prayer, okay? I'm not sure what that is. And guess what? Sometimes I, I, when, when we pray, it's like we're telling, we're like praying for everybody else, okay? I don't know if you ever heard people, I'm not, here again, I'm trying not to be critical, but don't pray to everybody else. Talk to the Father. Talk to God, Okay? I, I, I pray to one. I don't, I, and I sometimes I'm all, well, most often I'm by myself. So, so I don't have anybody to impress. But when I pray, I don't try to impress anybody. I'm talking to God. And so, you know, maybe you, you could get a little excitement in you. You're talking to the God of this universe, the one who will hear and the one who will answer your prayer. I mean, I can almost imagine. I mean, if my kids came up to me and like, hey, Dad, can I borrow the car? <laughs> oh, that attitude. <laughs> Ain't no way. And it, I, I, probably not. How we talk to him is so important. I mean, there's this fine line because I want to come humbly 
before my God. I mean, like Paul, I'm, I'm the foremost. I'm the chief of sinners. By all due respects, I have no rights or privileges to ask him of anything. And yet, through the blood of the Lamb, I can ask him everything. So I come boldly. I come as his kid, his child. I come as one who has been redeemed, bought back by him. And if he says, ask, by golly, I'm going to ask. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for the world. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't gamble. I, I don't do the lottery. I don't do any of that. I don't, to, that's, that's a waste of money. God doesn't give us permission to waste money. I don't care if you win a million dollars. That's a waste. Right. And certainly don't sit there and pray for a million dollars. What would you do with it anyway? Right. You'd waste it. Okay? <laughs> so uh, when, when we pray, I mean, I wanna, I'm going to ask him for anything. I pray for lost souls. I, I pray, you know what? Tuesday, well, Tuesday, this last Tuesday, big funeral. I mean, I'll tell you, friends, church was packed. There was, it was standing room only. It really was. And, you know, for John Benson and the family, wonderful. But I thought to myself, you know what? Why isn't it this way every Sunday? Amen. Every Sunday. And that's my prayer. God, would you fill the house? Not because it makes us any bigger or better or anything else. But I just know there's a whole bunch of people outside of these walls who need some hope. And they need some help. And they need someone to love them. And they need someone who will be kind and compassionate and fill a void in their life. And I think, what a better place than right here with us. Because that's what he did with us. The person who doesn't accept Jesus Christ as their Savior isn't believing. Or having saving trust in God's promise of salvation and the forgiveness of all their sins. Now, this doesn't mean that using the name of Jesus gives us some magical power, some mystical thing. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 instructs us to address all of our prayers to God the Father. Therefore, it isn't the saying of the name of Jesus or addressing our prayer to Him that is the point here, but praying as a believer in Jesus Christ. It means that we've come to God redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Not in our own name, or in our own power, our own strength, our wisdom, or creativity, or ingenuity, but we come in faith in the spirit of dependence on Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We can't expect the Lord to answer prayers if we have unconfessed sins in our lives. That's just another point. Would you read Psalm 66, 18 with me? If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Whoa. Did you just read that out loud? <laughs> See, either the Word of God is the Word of God, or we schwaffle it. We make it into what we want, right? Yeah, schwaffle, that's a good German word. I don't know if any of you Norwegians know that, schwaffle. It means you just kind of make things up. You schwaffle, okay? How about the next one, Isaiah 59, verse 2? Read that with me. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Ouch! Our sin separates us from God. Why is it important to confess our sins? If you want God to hear, you've got to come to him how? <laughs> Forgiven, cleansed, again. All right? You cannot expect the Lord to answer prayer when we're not living for the Lord. Psalm 20, uh, tw uh, Proverbs 28, verse 9. Read that with me. He who turns away his ear from listening to the law, even his prayer is an abomination. That means you can't go live a reckless life. You can't just go live out in the streets however you want. I, 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 I heard Ted... It, this morning, as we had prayer together, he said something that was so awesome. I don't know if you know how awesome. He says, you know what? i got to live what's on the inside, on the outside. It's the same person. I, I, as soon as I, I leave this crowd of people, I can't become somebody else. 
When I go to the workplace or my neighborhood, I, I, can't, I can't be somebody else. I've got to be the same all the time. I've got to live that way all the time. You turn your ear from the law, you go live that reckless life. He says, your prayer is an abomination. Anybody want to take a clue, a guess at what abomination means? <coughs> huh? <laughs> yeah, 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 an abomination is something very, very, very disgusting. Okay? That's putting it mildly. That's putting it mildly. Now, these are very strong words, and they make the point that we don't come to God in disobedience. The prayers of the disobedient are an abomination before God. They're disgusting. I remember uh, a couple of times that I really got in trouble with my dad. My parents uh, really disobeyed. I remember one time in particular, I was uh, at Mary Lutheran High School, and every year they had a uh, pancake breakfast. And uh, people came from all over the place, and the, the men's clubs at the churches, they, they did all the baking and cooking or whatever you do with pancakes. And, um, and, us, and then when we were in high school, us younger kids, uh, boys, we had to bus all the tables. And uh, I, it was a Sunday afternoon, and I wanted to go see a girlfriend and so I quickly did all my stuff, and then, you know, I asked my dad if I could use the car, and I did, and my dad's words to me were always the same, drive carefully. Well, I got home, and uh, I wasn't careful. Um, my dad had cement slabs that went in the garage, and uh, the rest of the garage was dirt floor, and uh, there was, it was wintertime, and there was ice underneath the tires and from drippage and everything, and so I couldn't get the car, I put it in reverse, but I couldn't get anywhere. I didn't think about putting some of that sand that was freely there underneath the tires. So what I did was I, I opened the door, and I, it was an old Dodge Dart, and I grabbed that door, and I put it in reverse, and I kind of had one foot out, and I gave it a push. Well, guess what? The car caught, and then it was I was backing out, the car door caught the garage. Yeah, I, I uh, just about ripped the car door off my dad's car, and I did take the garage off the foundation. I knew right then and there it probably was not a good thing to ask my dad if I could still go see my girlfriend. The prayers of the disobedient are an abomination to God. I can't just remain disobedient, careless in my life, and ask God to continue answering my prayers. Would you read with me 1 John 3, 22? And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Whatever we ask, we receive from him. Because we're doing pleasing, we're living our life for him. If we obey God, then he will answer our prayers. What are some clear commandments of God that we are to obey? Prayer, Bible study, witnessing, Christian leadership in the home, teaching children, being an example, being faithful and attending church, tithing, confessing our sin, putting Christ first in our life. All these are clear commandments in the New Testament. One who isn't faithful in these things are being disobedient and, I'm sorry, but they won't be blessed by God. Can't expect God to answer prayer if we aren't doing His will. And this involves more than just keeping the written commandments of the Lord. It involves doing what God wants us to do with our lives. Your every moment of your life is an investment for the king. Pastor Julie preached on that this morning. He's given you these coins. What do you do with those coins? God's invested how much in your life? How much do you invest back in him, in his work, in his kingdom? Would you read with me John 9, 31 again? We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. 
Now this involves living a godly life and following God's leadership. It's God's expressed will for us to be reading and studying His Word and understanding this. Let's read 2 Timothy 2, 15 through 18. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenius and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. These were two men who shipwrecked their faith. They walked away from the faith. And in doing so, you can't expect God to hear and to answer your prayers if you keep walking in the wrong direction. God's will for us is to be studying His Word and to be doctrinally sound in our beliefs. A church, like Lutheran Church of the Master, or individual who believes and practices false doctrine, is out of God's will, and their prayers won't be answered. Hebrews 10.25 tells us God's will for us to attend church. How about let's start reading in verse 22. Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. As you see the day drawing near, a place like this is going to be very needed. Brothers and sisters in Christ are going to be very needed. Why? Because you'll lose hope. You'll lose faith if you stand all alone. We're going to need each other. Lots of people take comfort in the fact that Christians aren't under the law anymore and we don't have to keep the Sabbath. But before the law of God set a principle in place, that one day of the week was set aside to worship Him and for rest. It goes all the way back to the garden. Israel paid a high price for ignoring God's law concerning worshiping Him, and believers will too. Clearly, God's will for His for God's will for His child is to be faithful to the house of God. The context is in uplifting each other in the Lord. There's nothing more discouraging than the church member who is unfaithful in their attendance. Everyone knows we should all worship the Lord on Sunday, and it hurts us to see our brothers and sisters in Christ disobeying God. You can't be an encouragement to others when you aren't faithful yourself. If you want to kill a church, hinder or stop the work of God, keep souls from being saved, then just stop attending church. Would you read with me Colossians 1.18? He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. We come together so that we're reminded he's in first place. It's God's will that the Lord Jesus Christ be first in our lives before all else. Listen to me, friends. Putting Jesus Christ first is the best thing that you can ever do. And that means before our pleasures, whatever they may be. That means before our agenda, our own wish list. For some, it might be some special service. Is God leading you in a particular thing to do? Has God given you the privilege to do some job at church? And are you faithful in it? And are you willingly doing it? Here's another one I, point I want to make. God doesn't answer the prayers of those who are not at peace with each other. We need to be at peace with one another to have our prayers answered. Would you read 1 Peter 3, 7 with me? And uh, let me just specify, husbands, please pay attention. <laughs> you husbands in the same way, 
Live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Huh? That's a woe. Yeah. So, gentlemen, if you're wondering why your prayers aren't answered, check your relationship with your wife. Family problems can surely cause our prayers not to be answered. <coughs> Arguing, bickering, fighting in the home will destroy it. It'll rob a home of peace and joy. It'll destroy the peace and security of a marriage. I've seen so many, and should I just say too many families destroyed, and children's lives totally messed up because the husband and wife won't get along. Notice I, I didn't say it was because the husband and wife couldn't get along. The truth is they could, but decided not to, and that's even more sinful. The wonderful thing is that in Christ Jesus, marriage problems can be overcome. That is, if the husband and wife want to. Do you realize the prayers from fathers and mothers for their children are not answered when they don't dwell in peace and honor one another? The husband might say, well, my wife is the problem and she's always fighting with me. Or the wife might say, it's always my husband's fault. Well, we don't have to fight back. And rarely is there not blame on both sides. The cure is to turn the matter over to the Lord, confessing first one's sins and then making the commitment to live for the Lord. If one partner does this, it will surely end at least half the problem and it will make room for reconciliation. The other night, I was not happy. I'm generally very happy. But the other night, I was not happy. I can't even tell you what the disagreement was. All I know was that I snapped at my wife and she snapped back. Hmm. Fine. I'll go outside. So I went outside, played with Dimwit Doug, the dumb dog, took care of the chickens, and it finally dawned on me, someone should probably say I'm sorry. <laughs> How long can I wait this out? <laughs> Not very long. I went in and I said, honey, I'm so sorry. Would you please forgive me? And, of course, then she rattled off about ten things that... <laughs> She's not here. No. She... And you know what? It was, it was all done and over with. But how much longer could that have gone on? And how, much, how often don't we do that? With our marriages, with our kids, our neighbors, our church family. Would you read Matthew 18, 19 with me? Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. You and I have to agree. We have to be in agreement if we're going to ask our Father. The principle is one of harmony. Model prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Harmony in the church family, each doing their share, plus helping others, seeking one another's well-being. God honors that. We need to come boldly. Hebrews 4.16, Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We've got to come boldly. We must be persistent in our prayers. In the parable account of the Lord teaching the model prayer in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus followed it with this parable. Let me read it to you. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers and says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, 
Yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. There's this thing called persistence. And sometimes we want to throw it up the flagpole and see if God salutes. And when he doesn't, we'll just do it ourselves. And clearly the Lord is teaching us that we should be persistent in our prayers. There have been things that Christians have prayed for for years. And God in his time answered. It's not that God doesn't want to answer. And that he wants to withhold the answer to our prayers. But God knows the time when it's best. Our persistence shows our faith in God and his promise to answer prayer. I like what Barnes says in his commentary on this passage. This is what he wrote. This is to be applied to God in no other sense than that he often hears prayers and grants blessings even long after they appear to be unanswered or withheld. He leaves them to persevere for months or years until they feel entirely their dependence on him, until they see that they can obtain the blessing in no other way, and until they are prepared to receive it. Often they are not prepared to receive it when they ask it at first. They may be proud or have no just sense of their dependence, or they would not value the blessing, or they may at, at, at that time not be best for them to obtain it. But let no one despair. If the thing is for our good, and if it is proper that it should be granted, God will give it. Let us first ask aright. Let us see that our minds are in proper state. Let us feel our need of the blessing. Let us inquire whether God has promised such a blessing. And then let us persevere until God gives it. Isaiah, speaking to disobedient Israel, gave them the promise of God. Read it with me. 65 verse 24. It will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. And here's the blessing and the promise of God. Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. Do you believe that? Yes. Yes. Whatever the past, the future is clean. We can decide this very moment, this morning, to live as God would have us to. And that we might have God's blessing and His promise in all we do. If there's sin and unfaithfulness in your life, now's the time to confess it to the Lord and come clean and have Him cleanse you from it. God is the God of new beginnings. Thank God he loves us so much. He does not scold and promises to give his help to us liberally if we ask in faith. Is it true that God will give us what, he, what we ask for? Yes. yes. But understand the reasons why. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank and praise you for this time and for this group of people. I thank and praise you for your word because there's no way we can make this up on our own. You, you speak to us and you answer us. And even in that answer then, we come to a greater understanding of who you are and what you want to do and why you want to do it. So give us a heart, a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us so that when we pray, when we agree in prayer, we see our prayers answered. Jesus, it's in your holy, precious name we pray. And all God's children say, amen. Thank you for your time. God bless you.